Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This is Dr. Bhanu Priya Rohila from the Department of English, Mohanlal Sukharia University, Udaipur. Today, we are going to discuss a famous romantic poem to a skylark, written by Percy Bysshe Shelley. I wish to let you know that the poem is a part of the paper named British Romantic Literature in the UGC CBC system of English honors. In this class, we are going to discuss this one of the most celebrated poems to a skylark by Shelley as a perfect example of Shelley's romanticism. Before we begin with the poem, let me familiarize you all with the poet Percy Bysh Shelley. Unlike the first generation romantic writers like Wordsworth, Coleridge and Saudi, Shelley belongs to the younger generation of the romantic writers and stands amongst the writers like John Keats and Lord Byron. Shelley was born in an aristocratic family in 1792 and died in 1822. Known for his revolutionary and rebellious nature, Shelley was expelled from his university for writing and publishing a pamphlet on the necessity of Islam. He was a strong believer of atheism. Moreover, he was against most of the social establishments and refuted the customs and traditions of the society. He was a scholar and a visionary. His ideas helped in shaping the romantic ideals of love and beauty to a great deal. After the suicide of his first wife, he married Mary Godwin, the daughter of Godwin who later came to be known as the great feminist Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Godwin was an English political philosopher who is also said to be Shelley's mentor. In this short span of his life, he wrote extensively. But Queen Mab, Alastor, the lyrical dramas Prometheus Unbound and the Sensei Poems like Adonis, which he wrote on the death of his friend John Keats, and a prose treatise, Defense of Poetry, are his most popular works. Besides, his nature lyrics or odes like Ode to the West Wind, The Cloud, To a Skylark are also very celebrated. He was closely associated with Lord Byron and John Keats. The present poem, To a Skylark, is a great literary piece which is often compared with John Keats' Ode to Nightingale. The two poems are addressed to the birds with their distinct characteristics that left the two poets mesmerized. Another poem with a similar title is also found in the Romantic poetry. It is To the Skylark, which is written by William Wordsworth. And the students must take a note of it to avoid any confusions. Shelley's To a Skylark was first published in 1820 and Shelley is said to have been inspired to write this while walking on an evening with his wife in Italy. The poet 
heard the song of a skylark there that inspired different emotions in him now let us look at the text so the first stanza reads as hail to the blight spirit bird thou never wert that from heaven or near it forest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art so the first stanza begins with an address to the bird that is skylark whom the poet calls a blight spirit which means a joyous spirit or a carefree spirit he goes on to say that the skylark is not a bird but a spirit from the heaven or somewhere near it and when it sings it basically pours out its heart and emotions in profuse strains that is abundant musical notes which are of unpremeditated art here it means that the skylark sings quite musically and very melodiously and her songs come very spontaneously they express her such emotions which are unforetold and unplanned thus the song of the skylark is a song of divinity for the poet this very idea of a bird as a spirit from the heaven reflects the romantic ideals of those times that find the most ordinary things look very extraordinary in sense also the nature as something divine and eternal shali's idea of beauty also is reflected here as he says that the bird's song comes very instinctively and he calls it an art that has aesthetics the next stanza reads as higher still and higher from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire the blue deep thou wingest and singing still dost soar and soaring ever singest here shali continues to talk about this divine creature and says that it soars higher and higher and this ascent from the earth is like that of a cloud of fire so the flight of the skylark is here being compared to the cloud of fire this simile is used here to suggest that as the skylark flies or rises higher the singing bird seems fiery and vibrant in the next line the blue deep suggests the sky above and he says that you move in the sky and the more you sing the more you soar and the more you soar the more you sing the visual imagery of the bird singing while soaring high in the sky the blue deep sky is very vividly portrayed in this stanza now coming to the next stanza the stanza number 3 it says in the golden lightning of the sunken sun over which clouds are brightening thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun so as the words suggest we can imagine the visuals with this picturesque description now the sun is setting and this setting sun is emitting a golden light which is making the clouds look very bright as bright as what we read in the last stanza the cloud of fire that makes them look like so 
So the fire-like golden brightness of the clouds is due to the setting sun and its bright light around. Further, he says, Thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. So here he again compares the skylark with an unbodied joy using a simile and here it further su supports the idea of skylark as a blithe spirit or something abstract which is beyond the worldly material things and is an emotion of pure joy like an unbodied joy whose rays with the setting sun or whose flight up above has just begun. So the flight of the skylark in the evening sky is the most delightful thing for the poet. Further, he says in the next stanza, stanza number four, the pale purple even melts around thy flight. Like a star of heaven in the broad daylight, thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. So, the evening sky having a pur pale purple shade melts into further darker shades while you, that is the skylark, when you fly and the poet again compares the skylark with a star of heaven, which remains unseen during the day. But its delightful voice and song can be heard even then. The next stanza comes, but uh, here let's read it with the last stanza. That is stanza number four only. Since the thought in the last stanza did not complete as there was no period in the last line. You can notice the comma after the word delight. So, like a star of heaven, in the broad daylight, thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight, comma. So continuing with this line, next he says in stanza number five, keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, whose intense lamp narrows with the white dawn clear until we hardly see we feel that it is there. So in the last stanza, the poet says that the skylark, like a star of heaven, is not seen in the daylight, but the shrill and delightful voice is heard and the evening also grows darker as it sings. Here he says, Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, that is the moon. So silver sphere is the moon. So the darkness of the night is pierced by the silver sphere or the moon only. So the moon rays are the arrows of the silver sphere and its intense lamp, that is its light, narrows or diminishes in the clear white dawn. So we see the arrows of the moon until it's, it is morning or until we are hardly able to see anything. Thus, in the daytime, it is like a bright star which is not seen and in the dark, again it's not seen. But its powerful and delightful voice ensures its presence. The poet further says in the next stanza, All the earth and air with thy voice is loud, as when night is bare, from one lonely cloud, the moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. So, this stanza 
also can be taken as an extension to what he said in the stanza number 5 he says here that the skylark fills the atmosphere with her own voice which is quite loud during nights and when the night is bare the moon is shining her beams from one lonely cloud until the heaven or the sky is overflowed with the moonlight similarly the whole atmosphere is overflowed with the song of this bird thus the lonely cloud is a metaphor used here for the skylark and her song is the shine or the beam of the moon that fill the heaven this very comparison of moon raining out its beams from one lonely cloud with the nature pouring out its divine music through the skylark and both overflowing the heaven above is something that only the romantic poets or the writers could do so beautifully moving on to the next stanza he says what thou art we know not what is most like thee from rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see as from thy presence showers a rain of melody so here meditating over its reality or its existence the poet wonders that we we the human beings do not know what it is what skylark is and what it is like so the idea that we have of what it is is not even closer to its real existence its reality he says that the drops of the showering rain that create a rainbow do not look as bright as the shower of melody of your voice of the skylark's voice is so shelley again here compares the beauty and musicality of the skylark's song with the drops of the rain that form beautiful rainbow above further in the next stanza poet says like a poet hidden in the light of thought singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to something sorry sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not so here he compares the skylark with a poet who is contemplating or musing over and thus the light of his contemplation is hiding his physical appearance and singing hymns or songs which are unbidden or uninvited since the hymns are those that are not sung in the world as they are the songs that can bring sympathy and hopes and fears to the world which the world has not paid attention to they don't want it thus he suggests that the skylark's physical appearance is hidden just like the poet in its sincerity and thoughtfulness and its songs are pure like hymns that have the power to transform the world into a place full of humanly feelings like sympathy fear and hopes which the world is deprived of now please note that the stanza ends with a colon instead of a period it suggests that the next stanza is in continuation to it so the next stanza that is stanza number 9 reads as like a high born maiden in a palace tower soothing her love laden soul 
in secret hour with music sweet as love which overflows her bower thus another comparison is made here and the poet compares the skylark this time to a princess with a love laden soul who in the secret hour when no one is around her singing to soothe her heavy soul the sweet music of the song full of love fills her bower so the skylark's songs are also similar to such a love stricken maiden who is full of pure emotions of love and pain and her songs also have the same sweetness of love this stanza also ends with a colon mark moving ahead the poet says in stanza number 10 like a glow worm golden in a dell of dew scattering unbeholden its aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view so again here the poet finds the skylark to be like a glow worm a glow worm basically is an insect which naturally produces and emits light it is generally found in the forests or in the areas that have plants and trees in abundance so he says here that it roams in a valley of dew and spreads its light without any moral obligation here by moral obligation shall it simply means that unlike human beings these lightning bugs or often called as the fireflies these glow worms do not restrict themselves from their natural behavior they spread their light or the aerial hue among the flowers and grass that hide them similarly the skylark also spreads the light of her songs though she gets concealed by several things again the last line is followed by a colon sign here further in the next stanza the poet says like a rose embowered in its own green leaves by warm winds deflowered till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet those heavy winged thieves continuing the comparison shale again here compares the skylark with a rose rose in the bower of its own leaves that later get deflowered or spoiled by the warm winds and till then it keeps releasing the rose keeps releasing the fragrance and this sweet fragrance of it intoxicates the heavy winged thieves that is the honey bees so here the term heavy winged thieves are for bees they steal the sweetness of the or the nectar of the flowers that's why shale calls them thieves moving on to the stanza number 12 shale says sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass rain awakened flowers all that ever was joyous and clear and fresh thy music doth surpass so the poet says the sounds of fresh rains when they hit the shining grass the flowers revived by the rain drops and everything like these that have ever been delightful clear and fresh 
in comparison to the song of the skylark look faded which means that the music of skylark surpasses everything that is ever pleasing otherwise ending with a period this stanza brings the poet's search to know what the skylark is to an end in the last four stanzas the poet has made several comparisons the idea that started with the question what art thou we know not after several speculations and comparisons ends with the thought that whatever it is it surpasses everything and in all these stanzas the poet that is shally who is known for having an eye for beauty in everything has used several sensory images one can hear the sweet music of the love the love song and then can see the light of the fireflies also can see the the rains pouring down and flowers reviving and then also can smell the sweet scent of the roses in these comparisons so his poetry creates the visual auditory and olfactory motifs all simultaneously moving on the next thing he says in stanza number 13 teach us sprite or bird what sweet thoughts are thine i have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine now clueless of what it is as he makes several comparisons he calls now the skylark a nymph or a bird and asks it to teach us to teach the human beings the sweet thoughts as hers as as the skylark has here by the sweet thoughts he means the sweet thoughts full of humanity compassion and as he said earlier the thoughts or uh, sympathy the thoughts of sympathy and hope and the like that the skylark has so further he says that even the praise of love or wine have not been able to offer such divine rapture or ecstasy that the skylark's thoughts or the songs do so the bird skylark is the divine being for the poet in the next stanza he says chorus hymenial or triumphal chant matched with thine would be all but an empty want a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want hymenial chorus are the wedding songs and the triumphal chants are the victory songs or any other celebratory song so all such kind of songs connote the events that bring immense happiness or joy to human life the poet tells the skylark that even the wedding hymns and the victory songs that often bring joy when matched with the songs of the skylark seem very dull they simply seem an exaggeration as they are but an empty want and some hidden want or the lack is always felt there moving ahead in next stanza he says what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain what 
fields or waves or mountains what shapes of sky or plain what love of thine own kind what ignorance of pain so here he further asks the skylark where from it derives its happy strain its delightful songs he wonders what kind of fields or waves or mountains or sky inspire the skylark or is it because of the love of a love for other birds of your own kind or is it because of the ignorance of pain that make your songs so joyful so he wants to know what is the source of inspiration of the songs of skylark in the next stanza he says with thy clear keen joyance languor cannot be shadow of annoyance never came near thee thou lovest but never knew love's sad satiety so the poet praising the skylark's song says that no indolence or sluggishness can ever occur when skylark's clear pleasant songs are there even there is no annoyance or anger that can be experienced by you and nothing causes irritation or annoyance to the skylark it laughs but it never experiences the boredom of the excessive love which is very usual very common with human beings thus it shows that the bird epitomizes liveliness and purity of love that never ends further in stanza number 17 he says waking or asleep thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream or how could thy no, how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream so the poet further appreciates this skylark by saying that whether it is awake or asleep that is fully conscious of the things or not it always thinks of death in a deeper and a more meaningful way than the human beings do and probably this is the only reason that the skylark sings with such notes or songs with such crystal like clarity that human beings lack in the next stanza he says we look before and after and pine for what is not our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought he highlights here the human tendency of not being able to be happy the mortals always look at the past and the future and the poet says that human beings always pine for what is not that is we always keep grumbling over things that we don't have so the human beings don't appreciate the things that they possess they have in hand unlike the skylark we don't know how to live in the moment and how to live truly in the present time even our most genuine laughter comes with some sort of pain and our sweetest songs come from the saddest of thoughts here it takes us back to the last to last stanza where shale says is it the ignorance of pain that makes you or your songs so delightful thus he deliberates 
upon the basic nature of human beings and the skylark. In the next stanza, he says, Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Here we can say that this stanza is an extension to the last stanza where the poet says that the humans have this weakness or flaw of looking back and forth in time and finding reasons to be sad. So now he says that even if the human beings could do away with the uh, with the emotions of hatred, vanity and fear which make them a normal human being or even if we were born ignorant of sufferings, he believes that we still could never come closer to the sweetness and joy that the skylark has. The next stanza says, Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Here, the poet calls the skylark scorner of the ground. That is, the scorner of the earthly or material things and tells it that the skylark's songs and sound are better than the best of the delightful sounds. He further says that even the skylark's skill of poetry is better than anything that is found or written in the books and uh, considered to be of great worth. So the superiority of Skylark over the insincere human efforts is quite evident in this stanza. Now coming to the concluding stanza, stanza number 21, he says, Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then as I am listening now. So in the end, the poet now requests the skylark to teach him half of the gladness that the skylark has. As even the half of what it has would be too much for the human beings. He wants it to teach him so that the harmonious madness that the Skylark has, he also would be able to sing with it and the world would listen the same thing what he is listening now. Thus, the speaker wishes the humankind to learn what the skylark knows. So, the interpretation of the poem ends here. Let us now talk about the structure of the poem. The poem To a Skylark is an ode and consists of 21 stanzas. Odes are the lyrical poems that are written to glorify or to honor someone, some person or event. And the lyrical piece generally exhibits the personal emotions or thoughts of the poet. Here, Shelley celebrates and personifies the bird Skylark and portrays it the way he himself has perceived it. Throughout the poem, Chalet has maintained 
a single pattern in all these five line stanzas the first four lines are in trochaic meter and the last line of each stanza is in iambic hexameter also called alexandrine a trochee is a foot that consists of one long or stressed syllable followed by one short or unstressed syllable and here it is a trochaic trimeter that is prominent in the first and the third line of each stanza since the second and the fourth line have only five beats and the last line of each stanza as i said earlier are alexandrines so an alexandrine is basically a verse having six iambic feet that is 12 syllables in one line the rhyme scheme of the poem goes as a b a b b moving on let's discuss about the poetic devices used in the poem shali's poetry is known for the extensive use of literary devices he has used similes and metaphors very generously like a cloud of fire like an unbodied joy like a star of heaven like a poet hidden like a high born maiden like a glow worm golden like a rose embowered are all the examples of similes and metaphors like the lonely cloud and scorner of the ground are also there he compares the skylark with different forms and sometimes just calls it a spirit or an abstract thing personification of the skylark is done throughout the poem the next device alliteration that is the repetition of sounds enhances its musicality and poetic beauty some examples of this alliteration are sunken sun pale purple silver sphere love laden soul in secret glow worm golden dell of dew warm winds never came near sad satiety death must deem sweetest songs and the list is long <clears throat> another very important literary device used here is anaphora that is the repetition of a word or a phrase in the beginning of a line what objects are the fountains as in stanza number 15 of thy happy strain what fields or waves or mountains or what shapes of sky or plain what love of thine own kind what ignorance of pain so here the repetition of the word what what thou art we know not as we also saw in stanza number 7 what is most like thee better than all measures of delightful sound better than all treasures that in books are found so these repetitions are the examples of anaphora now moving to the conclusion we can say that the poem is one of the best examples of the romantic poetry the themes of nature and its power and nature versus mankind are exhibited very strongly throughout this poem the skylark here has been used as a symbol or the representative of nature that is divine and purest in form and 
it is the same divine nature that is much needed to re-establish harmony, joy and peace for the human beings on the earth who are losing humanity in Throughout the poem, purity, innocence, and delightfulness, the nature in Skylark is glorious beautifully, and the poem is believed to be that inner knowledge that would gain humanity also highlights of poetry and music that made Skylark seem divine and the Skylark's song seems to be a spiritual meditation that transcends the earthly bounds. The ecstasy he feels in its song is awe-inspiring. So it can be said that Shelley takes the Skylark as a bard or a poet and the divinity of its music and song is a motivation for Shelley himself who is inspired to create such beautiful verses that would be in interest in the interest of the whole mankind. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you.